please give a warm welcome to Paul as he comes right now. Thank you. So hopefully I can deal with the, uh, the technology. You can see I'm not Glenn. Glenn's sitting over there. Abuse in that direction complements this direction. Great. This presentation is pretty similar to one I gave about three months ago. And you may not know it, but I'm actually not based out of Australia. I'm based out of Asia shortly to move to Dubai. So most of my investments and most of my business comes from the Asia and the Middle East areas as well as some out of uh, Europe. So I've sort of come through and working with Condor Blanco as chairman, seen the company develop, and we've really taken the company and dissected the company and done something really different saying, what can we do to add significant value to this resource that we have? What can we do to add significant value to the shareholders and their holding in Condor Blanco? And what can we do to take this company from the market capitalization it was, is now, to where we think it can be in the future? So we have uh, a change in strategy. And that strategy is really moving from drilling holes in the ground, being an explorer, to being a player in the bulk commodity sector. And we said iron ore, roughly we're around the iron ore sector because we're involved with the Marianas project, which I'll talk about, which is a magnetite project. Fantastic project, easy to get into, easy to produce a good cash flow, and easy to, to get up and running with our current knowledge of the Chilean markets. And the second project is coking coal, which of course is the prime uh, mineral resource other than iron ore, of course, that goes into uh, iron production. So we've come along the track of being centred around that iron economy and, and driven that forward. Not forgetting our other uh, projects as well, which are centred around the Chilean copper and gold uh, deposits that we have uh, options on. So two parts to, uh, to the particular story here. And if you like, three legs to our, uh, our particular stool. Uh, South Africa, coking coal, Marianas, the magnetite project, and then the continuing exploration projects that we have. So Marianas, this is a project which is a copper tailings project, and I've visited a few times. It's in an ecologically sensitive area, and we're actually adding to the, the ecology of the area by reprocessing this, this dusty, dry mineral and producing out of it a high-grade magnetite product, which is readily saleable uh, in, at the port, at the mine gate, or by export. <clears throat> the technology is intrinsically simple. It's a very simple uh, magnetic separation drum process, which requires really very little other pre-processing other than perhaps some crushing. And then finally, that product will be sold and will reduce the amount of uh, tailings by approximately 60 or 70 per cent. We've run this through a trial process. We've run this now through a 200 tonne bulk sampling process. And the results we're getting back continue to affirm that this is going to be a tremendous cash flow project for the company. Not long term. This will run, run, run of mine perhaps as much as five years. But it will get us through the phase that we're in now, which is developing the assets that we have to a stage where we can monetize the assets. So that's the Marianas project. A lot of questions you can ask on it, but that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. What we've also done with the Marianas, of course, is that we've started the, uh, the permitting as well. And that permitting process um, has based, been based upon a couple of factors. And you see the first thing here, a, a number which says 10 million euros, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And we've gone a route of debt funding for our projects rather than equity. And uh, we've, we've taken the view that we put the money into the projects that one, produce cash, or secondly, can be monetized fairly quickly. And we've gone through a process of loan monetization. And this is not, I'm a banker, or I was a banker. I came from the, the big C bank, which is not the Commonwealth Bank, but Citibank. That was my background. So we've taken, we've taken what is commonly a bank instrument process, and we've been able to turn that around and be able to capitalize on that and raise a, an amount of debt which we're using to fund these projects. It's not something you would do if you didn't have cash flow, which we have coming, or didn't have a project that you can monetize within a reasonable time period. But it does do a couple of things for us. It puts money in the till 
fairly quickly, but it also means we aren't diluting down the shareholders. Anyone who's seen me speak before will notice that one of my major objections to going back to shareholders is you're continually diluting shareholders, especially those who've come in early on in the piece, and continue asking them to contribute to the company and contribute uh, more and more of their, their hard-earned uh, wealth and investments into a company. We've taken a different route and said, okay, we do need equity and we've taken equity and we've ring-fenced that for OPEX, but from the CAPEX side, we've gone the debt route. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. So what we've done now is that we've, uh, we've gone to a project in the magnetite area which we can get up and running within 6 to 12 months. We've taken the option to purchase 100% of that and we've gone with outsourcing the operations of that, that particular project so that we can con clearly control the, the operational costs by using an outsourced uh, processor, La Certa, who happens to have exactly the same technology doing exactly the same thing in La Serena. Uh, very close to Copiapo where we have our particular tenement. We've then taken the opportunity to look at a resource project that's very close to being marketable that comes in four sections, four separate tenements, which is in total called the Signa project. And we've taken that and we've said to the guys, okay, we're going to fund you, we're going to, and we're going to have a sequential investment in the project. As we prove a resource, we'll be able to put more money in and subsequently more money in, and we're going to monetize, with their permission and agreement, monetize the first of the projects, which is a high quality, easy to define resource called the Jewel. Now, anyone who's been in the papers recently has seen coke and coal disaster, pricing through the roof, Australian companies <coughs> exiting the field, why would you be in coke and coal? Well, for a very simple reason. All the coke and coal in South Africa at the present time is imported from Queensland. Think $20 paying for that big ship to come from Queensland to dump coke and coal in South Africa, which is, ironically, of inferior quality to the coke and coal that we're able to mine out of the Jewel project. So I think the economics speaks for itself. The Jewel project also throws off a middling component after beneficiation which is immediately saleable to ESCOM. And if you've read the papers, ESCOM has an energy shortage. So the middling project, the middling pro, uh, product out of our dual pro project basically pays the OPEX. And the cap and the profits are coming surely, surely from the coke and coal sales, which again will be an internal sale. We don't have to worry about world competitive prices because we don't have to worry about duties, we don't have to worry about transport. This product will be saleable in South Africa. So therefore, that project is one, once we define the resource, we've done large bore tests, we know what the coking quality is, we know that on both sides of the tenements there's operational mines, so coking coal doesn't get up and move around, so we know subject to major faulting, which is not apparent, that there we're going to have a resource there. Is it going to be X? Is it going to be 2X? Who knows, but we'll know in six to eight months. At that point, we've got a product or a project that can be taken to the market and can be monetized. That monetization of the project, in turn, repays the debt, <coughs> plus quite a bit more, and allows us to really move on the project that we're excited about, which is called Chapezi 2. Chapezi 2 potentially is one of the biggest coke and coal projects and, and areas in South Africa. Everyone's gone to Mozambique to chase coke and coal, spent a lot of time in both those countries. Mozambique, if anyone's been there, great coke and coal, how do you get it to the port? There is no infrastructure. There is no way of doing it. South Africa, where we have this particular tenement, is an extension of the same coal seam, but it just happens to sit on a fairly lightly used um, rail line. If you took a contra view and said, OK, the price of coke and coal, worst case, is not sufficient for us in South Africa, because coke and coal is not thermal coal, you don't export hundreds of millions of tonnes, there's plenty of port capacity, especially in Derby, where you can export um, this uh, particular coke and coal. So we've got those projects underway. And then we've got the exploration projects, which are gold, uh, silver and, and copper gold, which we're going to continue to drill as, as the resources allow us. And really the critical path for Condor is not the cash. 
we've got the cash in the bank and by carefully managing, it, it, managing the cash it will see us through for a considerable period. But it really is man, the managerial resources. Do you want to be a 50 person company drilling up large portions of Chile or do you want to be a focused company being, being very tight with shareholders money, being very careful to deliver on time and uh, on track for the projects you take on. And we've taken the view that we're going to focus. And that's why the Chilean projects will continue, but they're not going to con continue to the extent that was happening before, that we're focusing the entire managerial resources on those particular assets, because they aren't being, we're not able to monitor the, monetize those in the near term. We'll continue to drill them, and as they get closer to monetization over the next three, four, five years, we'll accelerate time and effort. They're nice to have, but they're not on the priority list at the moment. Marianas is, and the Jewel project is, and after the Jewel, probably Chapezi 2 will be. So, the team. Small team, four, uh, four, uh, four board of directors and um, executives, uh, number two. So we're in a small team, we've got a number of uh, employees in Chile and we outsource a lot of the work that we do. Uh, in South Africa we've teamed up with Signet which has an on-ground uh, on resource to run the, the exploration projects, the drilling projects and we've been very lucky and fortunate to retain South Africa's foremost coal geologist, Pete Meyer, to be able to uh, be our uh, geologist, independent geologist in this pro process as well. And Pete lectures around the world um, in, in coal, particularly um, coking coal. And uh, he's, uh, he's come on board as an independent uh, uh, assistant to get this project moving. So let me talk a little bit about um, coking coal. Coking coal is, is seen by many people as being uh, a, pro a product which in Australia we, we had a monopoly on for a long period of time. We, we did in Australia produce, particularly out of Queensland, New South Wales, some of the best coking coal pro products in the world. And we did that not because in their intrinsic nature they were the best, but we were able to blend them and we were able to mine them at a competitive rate that, that made the, the use of uh, coking coal from for example, the US into Asia, uncompetitive in terms of a price point. What happened in South Africa, they did have small coking coal deposits that they, uh, they had uh, and they were able to mine. And Chapezi, we talked about Chapezi too, but the original Chapezi resource was mined in South Africa and mined to the extent that this year, uh, this will be the end of the mining of that particular resource and there will be no more coking coal coming online until our particular project comes online and perhaps a Coal of Africa project comes online as well. Coal of Africa is a little bit betwixt and between. They're doing thermal and coking, whereas we're focusing on the coking aspects. So we have a project that sits between two large players. We have a project that's easy to bring to, uh, to market and that's one that we're, we're going to be able to uh, monetize quickly. We then have following at Chapezi 2, which you see on this particular slide here. We then have the Universal Annex project, which is another large uh, project. And then we have the Mopane project, probably the last of the projects that we're going to look at. So we have a portfolio that's going to see us active in South Africa for at least a decade. So we, we have entered South Africa knowing that this is a long-term commitment, but one where we think there's a reasonably high chance that we're going to monetize very quickly and be able to repay the debt and move on to being a, a, pro, a company which has a continual cash flow from uh, our particular projects. You can read that, there's a lot of words there, but basically um, exploration in South Africa is something that we know how to do through our Cigna partners. Uh, very manageable in terms of pricing uh, compared to other parts of the world, Australia being one of those where exploration is extremely expensive because of the geographical distances and also just simply the costs of labour and, and materials. And we're able to do that at a very competitive uh, price. And we're also able to um, uh, use the, the fact that the jewel is fairly easy to get to in terms of de minimis capital requirements if people wanted to take it to extraction and production. 
Is extraction and production one of our criteria in the jewel? Absolutely not. We're looking at a trade sale of, of the jewel project at the right time, which is either pre-DFS or post-DFS, and we're still talking about that. So drill out proposition. When are we likely to finish that? Well, I can tell you with certainty it will be finished this year in November. Um, that's the end of the drilling season. What we're doing is taking core samples, wireline logs, and analysing them on a monthly basis. So there's not going to be, here's the DFS or here's the JORC report. There's going to be monthly updates of what's happening. And at the point that we think we have sufficient certainty, we'll be taking this through an investment bank to various players. The obvious people you talk to, as I had mentioned, are those producing iron ore in South Africa or those who have tenements adjoining ours who would sorely love to have this as an addition to their current projects. And then we would take it to the Asian market and then we would probably take it to the, the international European market. Um, experience with the Indian market is that their time frame of decision making would see me long retired, probably my children taking over the negotiations, so we wouldn't be focusing on the Indian market in the near term. So that's, that's the jewel. The drilling program, as you see, 7.5 months uh, woe to go. We're ready to start. Um, deposits have been paid with, uh, with drilling contractors by our signet partners um, as part of their commitment to this project. And we have a pretty ambitious pro program based upon, I think, fairly economic numbers here. So uh, for you know, three, four million dollars, um, this is US dollars, so roughly le somewhat less than five million Australian, we've completed a full drilling program to SAMREC specifications, not JORC, SAMREC being a higher level, uh, even though people don't like to hear it, SAMREC is actually tighter on its requirements than JORC. Uh, so we'll have a JORC code, a SAMREC code resource defined. We will have uh, all the steps taken for pre-DFS and we'll be in a position to go to Mr. Buyer somewhere in November, December and hello, would you like to talk to us about our resource? Any day, coking coal of this quality in the ground would sell for one to five dollars a US tonne uh, in ground resource and we know that's somewhere where we're going to get one would be ridiculously low five would be the best of the market so somewhere in between is our expectations and you know and I'm not going to be able to talk about the resource because ASX will jump up and down but you know that if we don't get 30 million tons defined in the resource statement that we actually don't have to continue with the project so you know Two and two of the maths tells you where our expected return is. Marianas. So we said cash flow, cash is king, and Marianas is a project with very little capital we can get up and running. Um, virtually no capital if we go the full outsourced route, but that's fairly unlikely. What we'll probably be doing is being, having a combination of bringing in a third party operator to actually run the machinery, run the day to day processing and then purchasing or, or contributing to the purchase of the capital equipment, which by its nature is not that expensive. Our fallback is to actually uh, go to a local contractor completely to run the equipment for us and not go down the route of a formal JV. We've got a number of options, but what we've done is proven that the project has the financial parameters that we've said, proven that the project is viable, and we're now going through to the governmental process to say, pro processes to say, hey guys, we need your permission to go and mine this. We can mine it today in a limited range of uh, processing, uh, but we prefer to go to the full scale. And we'll be able to also, through the cash flow, buy out the remaining 49% uh, of the project such that we have total control of the project. And it's not going to run away, the pricing's fixed and we're just waiting for the cash flow rather than go back again to take either our debt or our equity and go and buy it. We see that we'd rather have this in production and use that cash flow to go and purchase the remaining equity in the project. So where we're at, we've also talked to Lacerta, uh, who is our preferred joint venture partner, and said, hey, you've seen the results. In fact, we've run the results through one of your plants, a suboptimal plant, but we've run it through one of your plants. What do you think? And they've said, hey, we like it. We'd like to be involved. 
and we're now talking about commercial terms. So we think we're in a pretty good position to have this up and running in a reasonable period of time, <coughs> dependent upon processing of the permits, of course, uh, which is uh, which our permitting provider have told us six months, maybe it's nine months, maybe it's 12 months, but six months is what they've said. But that's the sort of time frame we're talking about in getting this thing up and running. And in that period of time, there's ample opportunity to either purchase a, a magnetic separation plan in Chile, and there's plenty of those, or buying one brand new to specification to, to design to our requirements from China which is the usual provider, and who, by the way, make fairly good equipment uh, from what I've seen on some of the plants, and being able to bring that into Chile and put that into operation. We have a pathway here, you know, is it going to cost us one million? We don't think there's probably going to be uh, as much as a million dollars in capex, even if we did this 100% ourselves. So we're, we're, looking at, um, we're looking at a fairly easy payback. And what we've done on the back end of that, it's great to say, hey, you know, I've got 20,000 tonnes of magnetite sitting there. We've got a letter of intent from Jiangxi Resources basically to take that magnetite and go and sell it to their providers in China. And if we don't have them, then there are other play people who will buy it. And we actually sit at a, at a pumping station for a slurry pipeline that, by the way, pumps magnetite down to the ports. So we could also sell it probably at a lower price, but still can sell it to a, a local provider who would immediately take the offtake because their slurry pipeline isn't working at capacity. So we stand in pretty good stead on the various options that we have uh, in front of us. Carachapampa, um, we've, we've talked about this in the past years. Exciting project. We've put down a number of holes, come up with some pretty good results. But as most tenements go in, in, in Chile, these are huge tenements and you drill them season by season and as the results continue to give you an idea of where the resource is, you continue to put time and effort into them. And this year we'd like to, but probably 2015, the caveat being, as I said, managerial resources, the mental resources more than the financial resources, uh, we would continue with that drilling program with external contractors. The diamond drilling program, and you can read through these slides, everything says that this is a great tenement. There's no reason to doubt that this will be a large, interesting um, tenement for major players in, in copper and gold um, in Chile and uh, internationally. And we'll continue along that, the line of drilling out that, that project until it is very interesting. And we can talk about it, um, we talk about it in relation to other projects which people do. We know that there is significant mineralisation in the vicinity. We know that the Kingsgates um, project has been well received and is progressing. So there's no reason to believe that the Carachapampa project that we particularly drilling will be any different. And again, some technical information, what we've intersected, etc. So. I guess it comes down to, if you're an investor in the company, why are you going to invest? Well, in the last six to nine months, we've, with very few exceptions, delivered on what we've said. We've brought in the cash to be able to capitalise on projects. We've brought in some pretty interesting projects into the fold at significant discounts to market value. We have a clear path to the monetization of the projects which says, hey, Mr. Investor, Mr. Shareholder, there's, there's returns to the company. And we've seen that in our share price as well. And that's, that's increased uh, quite satisfactorily. We have a, a path that's not just one year, but as much as a decade before we even reach the end of the, the Signet expansion projects and the uh, resource projects. We have Marianas, which will provide us five to six years of cash flow, and there's other projects that can be picked up in Chile to extend that. And we have some pretty neat tenements uh, around the Chilean area that we can continue to drill. Also, the other thing that gives us priorities in 12 months that's, that's not there 
is the intellectual property that we acquire. We, we have internally in the company the intellectual property of being able to develop to market readiness projects that we're able to then on sell to the majors, on sell to interested parties in geographically diverse continents, South America and South Africa. Therefore, making sure that we've minimised geographic risk, political risk if you like, as well as being quite diverse in terms of the product portfolio. We talk about iron ore, magnetite and co coking coal, but we're actually in a range of bulk commodities and we're able to fairly quickly move to those that we predict are going to be the more interesting in the coming 12 to 18 months and move to monetize those um, as required. And at the end, we disclaim <laughs> disclaimer and competent person statement, which I always thought is quite amusing. We've talked to you for 20 minutes and now we disclaim all knowledge and all responsibilities. But of course, we, we, have, uh, we have you, the shareholder, to, uh, to be responsible to and we continue to, uh, to strive to, uh, to meet your requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you.